military attaches from all over the world assemble in Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, for Armed Forces Day. It is like a market in reverse. The salesmen are there to see what they can get out of the buy. They come to the reviewing stand to look for gaps in the parade which they can fill. They're peddling more than arms. They're also there to extend influence. In a privileged position is Britain. As May 4th, the new British ambassador finds her seat, she can rely with confidence on a special relationship, of which we will hear more later. Mozambique, a former Portuguese colony, stretches along the southeastern coast of Africa. It has valuable ports on the Indian Ocean, especially the capital, Maputo. President Joachim Shisano, leader until recently of a Marxist state, has become a pragmatist. The memory of past colonial exploitation had kept Western investment out. Now 15 years of decline and a long civil war has forced his country to its knees. So the military discipline on show here is a sham and belies the disorder that is Mozambique. Its army is ill-equipped and ill-trained to cope with its long-running guerrilla war. It is a small army of conscripts with professional officers. Pay and conditions are poor morale is low. Despite the spit and polish on display, their equipment is broken and run down. Spare parts are hard to come by. The country is broke. Partly because of war, partly because of natural catastrophe, partly its colonial inheritance. Weapons like these have proved useless against guerrillas in wars all over the world. President Shisano knows that Mozambique's friends and partners may be as dangerous as her enemies. We cannot end with exploitation of men by men among Mozambicans themselves, and it would be uh, even more difficult to end that exploitation of men by men when it comes to uh, exploitation of the Mozambicans by uh, our partners in their participation but we'll try to keep the maximum we can we can keep from what they are going to bring to us uh, we have no choice we have no choice because uh, well these buildings do exist they've got uh, electricity uh, we cannot pretend that they don't exist, they don't have electricity. And to say that, well, don't invest because we don't need your electricity. We are going to live in our hearts with uh, firewood uh, in the forests. We, we, we cannot longer say that. In line with this pragmatic diplomacy is a British team training a special forces battalion of Mozambican soldiers. Adopt the lion position. Get up. In your own time, carry on. Ready? Close. For former British soldiers looking for work, Mozambique is fertile ground. Let me first say that they're, they're very trainable. Uh, they react well to, to consistently good training uh, and good leadership. Um, and uh, I know that there's a popular belief amongst certain uh, nationalities here that uh, these soldiers are not trainable. Uh, we, we dispute that hotly. They are. Colonel Baxter's base is the Polona Hotel. From here, he runs a commercial operation for DSL, Defence Systems Limited. His men are former British soldiers, mostly from the SAS. We've been invited uh, to uh, train in this country, to operate in this country, by uh, the government and the president of Mozambique. And this government and president is recognised by 
every nation uh, in the world, except, of course, by Renamo. For the Mozambican army out on patrol, Renamo is the enemy. The national resistance movement, long supported by South Africa, has opposed the country's Marxist government since soon after independence. In 15 years of war, the government says, 700,000 have died. There are other uncountable casualties of war. This one has left thousands of orphaned children, many of them troubled by horrifying, scarifying memories. I'm Kulovania, Isidan Kolo. I'm Isidan Kolo. I'm Isidan Kolo. I'm Isidan Kolo. Isidan Kolo. The second legacy of war is poverty, as bad as anywhere in the third world. Children whose homes and means of survival are the rubbish dumps of Africa. The third legacy are the refugees. The war has forced some three million people from their homes. <coughs> Of a population of 14 million, as many as a quarter are now dependent on international food relief. <laughs> Renamo has repeatedly mined or ambushed the railways, looting goods and killing civilians. In 1975, the railways carried 18 million tons of goods for export. Last year, only three. Mozambique used to be the world's largest producer of cashew nuts. Nearly 200,000 tons 15 years ago, only a quarter of that last year. In nine years, Mozambique's foreign debt increased from one billion to four and a half billion dollars. Just servicing the debt costs more than twice the total value of the country's exports. It's a game to be played, very difficult though. The whole world is suffering from it. The external debt of all, all the countries in the world is a, a, a consequence of uh, the weakness of countries like ours and the people like the laborers uh, to fight against uh, all this exploitative uh, machination of uh, the multinationals. Uh, but we will try to get the maximum. We cannot isolate ourselves from this world. The world is like this today. We have to continue fighting together with other countries to change it. But meanwhile, we will try to have our laws 
determining uh, the ways of uh, participation of the multinationals in our country, which may bring in some advantages for our, our people. In 1983, Samora Michel, Mozambique's first president, went to see Mrs. Thatcher. Marxist dogma was to be replaced with British know-how and equipment. DSL got involved in Mozambique through an approach, in fact, from Samora Michel, the late president. He wanted a special force trained. He went to London. He had a very successful meeting, I understand, with Mrs. Thatcher. And during the meeting, uh, he asked her if it would be possible for uh, certain weapons to be supplied to the special force and for perhaps the British to be involved in the training of this force. And uh, Mrs. Thatcher agreed to uh, issue licenses uh, so that the new British Army weapon could be sent out. Uh, and we started training uh, this special force outside uh, Maputo in August. Uh, 1986. Other nations like France and America send military advisors from their respective armed forces, yet the British government elects to send a private defence company to train special forces in Mozambique. Is that right and, and why? I think perhaps I've misled you. The British government did not elect to, to, uh, to send a, a, a commercial company to Mozambique to train soldiers. Um, it was very much a commercial arrangement from, from the start. Uh, it, it, it's got approval, uh, the nod, if you like, from, from the British government in the, insofar that they supplied the fairly sophisticated weaponry needed to uh, support this, this force. I mean, specifically what sort of weapon? Well, the SA-80 rifle and the second-generation night sight, uh, both of which require export licences before they can be released from, from England. It would be wrong to say that there's any uh, special relationship or that we were sent by the British government. Uh, that was not the case. It was an entirely commercial... Uh, operation. So you were introduced um, for a commercial operation, yes. Um, but then sought the approval of the British Foreign Office that you can undertake this particular contract. Mm, that's right. The uh, the finance for this operation was, was was commercial. Are you prepared to say which particular commercial operation it is, or would you rather not? Uh, I think I'd rather not. With so many military salesmen in town, Colonel Baxter looks over the competition. Currently, I believe there are six different nationalities involved with the army here. Virtually what we have, if you like, is a military omelette or a military tower of Babel. We have North Koreans, Russians, Cubans, East Germans involved with the security here. There's quite a hodgepodge of different nationalities. And this problem is going to have to be addressed by the Mozambican government. They're going to have to make a choice. Otherwise, they're going to head for chaos. Chaos is not hard to find in Mozambique. Africa. <laughs>
weapons of every kind coming from west and east travel on every train. This is only a local, going no more than a hundred miles from the capital, Maputo. But it is frequently attacked, and those who travel on it become prepared for an ambush. It's a sign of progress that trains run at all. Armored cars carrying soldiers now keep the line open, but it was not always so. In March 1984, a historic meeting on the Mozambique-South Africa border. Two old adversaries, President Machel and South Africa's Prime Minister Bota, arrived to make a deal. Mozambique would no longer harbor guerrillas from the African National Congress. South Africa was to stop funding and supplying the Nama. But Bota reneged on the accord. Two years later, Samora Machel set off for Malawi to a mini-summit of frontline states to discuss the war. He never returned. What remained of the presidential jet was strewn over half a mile of a valley just inside South Africa. The Russian-built plane disintegrated on impact. As a direct result of the trip, 10,000 Renamo guerrillas were forced out of Malawi, back over the border into Mozambique. On the death of Machel, conditions inside Mozambique deteriorated badly. The new president inherited a worsening war. We're here purely as professional trainers. That's the first difference. We have no combat role in Mozambique whatsoever. It is not our war. That is not to say that we don't have immense sympathy for what is going on here. Um, but uh, the fighting must be done by Mozambicans uh, with uh, every assistance that we can give them uh, through the training that we give the soldiers. Their training is nearly over. For these young men, fighting the civil war will soon become a reality. Deep inside northern Mozambique is the tea-growing region around Kuamba. The town is a haven of security in a region made dangerous by war. At Kuamba, exports from Malawi join the tea and other local products loaded at the railhead for the hazardous journey through rebel-held territory to the seaport of Nakala. To protect that vital link, a battalion of Mozambique Army Special Forces is being trained. In former times, Kuamba was a thriving market town. Today it is secure for only two miles outside its perimeter. At the railway station, time matters less than when there were timetables to meet. Then the once bustling yard saw thousands of tons of goods off to the coast. Until recently, no train had left for three months. Keeping them moving would be part of the responsibility of these special forces. In a village only a mile from their camp, 
A training exercise is led by Colonel Roger Brown. The uh, British Army has been involved in counterinsurgency operations since the First World War. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia operated uh, as an insurgent in the desert, and we learned many things from that. We've been involved in counterinsurgency in uh, Malaya, Aden, Borneo, Oman, and Northern Ireland, and we've got a great wealth and depth of experience in those types of operations. I believe that uh, we offer the very highest standards of training in that particular field, and uh, we have a tremendous amount to offer. Being a British Army soldier is, in fact, much easier than being a, a contract soldier because you're fighting for your loyalty, for your country, for your queen and your regiment. Um, as a contract soldier, those loyalties are not there, and one has to fight for what one believes in, and it can sometimes be a lot more difficult. I think if the government of a country are genuinely trying to better the lifestyle of the people in that country and to develop that country, then I believe I would back them. If uh, the people running a country were purely there to line their pockets and to exploit the population, I most certainly would not work for them. I'd be quite happy to join and lead a group of insurgents to overthrow that regime. The environment in which we're operating in here in Kwamba is an operation environment. We've had bandit contacts within five kilometers of the town. Certainly, as far as British team members are concerned, they maintain at all times a very high standard of operational readiness. Every time we leave camp, we carry live ammunition, and we would be ready to fend off any attacks should they take place. Second in command at Kwamba is Major Bill Simpson. He's a former member of the SAS. I believe the British soldier is one of the best fighting men in the world. He's versatile. He can work in most environments, the jungle, desert, in Northern Europe. With 26 years in the business, I can offer more than what I've seen from the Russians around here. In the world in general, the upsurge in terrorism, it's increasing all the time. Also, civil strife in various countries. Here in Mozambique, I can't see an end to this bandit problem in the near future. And um, at present, there is just not enough instructors to go around in this country. Major Lee Giles is the quartermaster. I was born in South Korea, and I came over to England in um, 1958. I uh, was raised in uh, Indian Thames and went to school there. Uh, up till the time I left and joined the army. He was in the SAS too. Now he's thinking of leaving military life. Because I've been doing this for over 10 years, I've been thinking about it for a long period. It's certainly unfair for my family and the children. It's difficult because every year you say, right, I'll do one more year or two more years, then finish. But uh, because you were trying to maintain the same standard of living, if you went back, which you like to do, then it is always difficult getting the right type of job back in England. Um, but I, what I'm hoping to do is that uh, maybe one more year, famous last word, and uh, see if I could settle back in and try and run a hotel, a smallish type hotel in Torquay, and certainly not as faulty towers, hopefully not, but, uh, and try and make a go of it. This is a central drill, cleaning weapons, because these are the new high-tech particles which were part of the deal Mrs. Thatcher made with Samora Michelle. These Mozambican Special Forces trainees are among the few soldiers in the world outside the British Army equipped with the SA-80. Major Bart Fouché wonders if, in these circumstances, a Russian gun would be more suitable. Personally, I prefer the AK to the SA-80 for the following reasons. One, it is a well-proven assault weapon. Secondly, if the weapon is dirty, it will still fire. Unlike the SA-80, you've got to keep the weapon very clean so it could actually function all the time. In a third world country, it is very difficult to maintain it out in the field. I find it is not soldier-proof. 
I think it's too complicated for the average soldier in a third world country. But mind you, it's a very accurate weapon. Good firepower. And uh, for Europe, theater, yes, it's a very good weapon, but uh, not in Africa. As Bart has stated, this weapon is a beautiful weapon. I like it. I carry it myself as my personal weapon. But it must be kept squeaky clean. It's definitely got to be looked after for the soldiers in the third world. Sometimes oil is not available. Uh, we're getting uh, stoppages and we've got to keep on top of them, make them clean their weapons all the time. When we're traveling on convoys, uh, we're traveling in a, a permanent cloud of dust. And after half an hour, uh, this thing, it's, uh, it's like, um, it's like axle grease inside there. Everything just slows down. And uh, it's, we find it even difficult to chamber around when you cock the weapon. For this part of the world, third world countries, you need a bog basic weapon. convoy is nearly ready to set off to collect a consignment of tea. It will be a journey through 70 miles of Renamo-held territory. In the past, there have been many attacks. two trucks with the guns on the back. Make sure these blokes get all their kit off because the last time the kit was all over the thing and they couldn't move the gun when they were in contact. With them goes a quiet Irishman, Major Paddy Burns. We moved up here to Kwamba to start our operational role um, in May 87 and have been here ever since operating convoys and uh, escorting trains. Bill Pizzi has seen active service in the Congo and Vietnam. The men we have trained and, and, and the ones that are currently under our instruction are very good. Um, for the most part, um, they're quite keen um, and they make quite good soldiers. Um, they, um, they're all um, press ganged into the army. They're, you know, they're not um, willing participants, but um, by and large, they, uh, they like, I think they're proud to be in the Special Force. One well, of the dangers they face is being ambushed. We have about 120 kilometres of road between here and uh, Gurui, and basically, for a whole distance, uh, it's bandit country. And in fact, we've lost five killed and quite a number of wounded. So are DSL's men mercenaries? Absolutely not, says the company. Despite appearances, they are, in the jargon, security advisors. They don't go on convoys, official. Mercenaries are something else. 
I think mercenaries are all things to all men. It rather depends on how old you are and what images you can remember. Uh, if you're my age, then you will go back to the Congo in the 60s uh, and then move up to, uh, the, to the 70s with, uh, with Angola. Um, and of course in the 80s we have Rambo 1, 2 and 3. Uh, the image basically is the same, that of a, of a white, um, fairly scruffily dressed soldier driving an open jeep festooned in, in weapons um, with black soldiers sitting behind at the head of a, a flying column going to relieve some beleaguered city. I've worked in other armies and I've never ever come across the tremendous logistic problems that we're facing here in Kwanda. The special forces operated for long periods of time without boots, no support weapons. We have absolutely no medical supplies whatsoever. We have critical shortages of ammunition. Food is also a major problem. Most of the soldiers suffer from dietary deficiencies, particularly in the protein areas and uh, we try our best to feed them, but it is inadequate when one looks at the, the physical tasks that they have to perform. I can say that we are four months behind on wages at the moment, and this is another critical thing. Do you think that this war is winnable? I believe it is winnable, yes. Um, it will take time and it will take money, uh, and at the moment the country does not have money, so that is a, a major stumbling block. A few weeks ago, most of these young men were sitting in cinemas or football grounds. Mostly illiterate, taken against their will, few of them had any idea of the causes they would be fighting for or against. The soldiers that we are working with are conscripts. Um, none of them voluntarily join the army. Uh, they are brought in to us from all over northern Mozambique and uh, are deposited on the airstrip here in Kwamba. We then take them in hand and initially it is a bit of a struggle to weld them into a team and give them some form of spirit and morale, but eventually it does work. Unfortunately, the recruits that we get here are conscripted. They don't really have a choice. It would be better for us if we had volunteers, because a volunteer is, is worth 10 press men, as far as I'm concerned. But with what we've got and the training that we can give them, they are actually turning out to be reasonable soldiers. If we had the equipment and the facilities, which we don't have here, we really um, improvising all the time, but with good equipment, good facilities, we could do better. Remember, there is a sequence in which you strip your weapon. Recordar que existe uma sequência de desmontagem da sua arma. Go! say in, in what turns up at the gate. Of course we have say in what finally passes the initial selection, which is a mixture of, of, of a very basic uh, medical examination, uh, followed by fitness training, uh, followed by his ability to handle a, a weapon, for instance to, to close the, the right eye, um, and that he is reasonably coordinated. Now if, if, if the recruits can't achieve those basics, then they, they will be discarded. We're having problem over there, Manuel. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well done. Ready! Run! Weapon fire, one or two more rounds. Weapon stop! 
arma dispara mais uma, duas munições, arma em craft. The task that DSL's officers face is to turn these raw recruits into crack troops. Okay, one, two, three, four. Where is the single? Single. This group is very grande. We need to the Aquino group in the center. Perceberam? Percebido. Dominaram-se esta arma. Lembra-se de olho, alça atrás, ponta de mira, pontaria, centro. Perceberam? Ok. Five rounds we wanted on the target. Not seven. Ok, five rounds, not seven. Está a perceber? É? Vamos entrar nas escolas agora. É? Vamos contar. I work for a bona fide security company. We provide a service to bona fide governments or bona fide uh, companies where we will uh, train their men, try and improve their lot. We're, we're not in the business to earn lots of cash and overthrow people that are not liked or uh, try to um, change any policy in any country. Why do you think there is such an abhorrence for the mercenary profession? Um, there are certain elements of the profession which have uh, gone beyond the pale, in my opinion. They've done stupid things and they've brought what, in general terms, through, throughout history, has been a very honourable profession. Uh, they've brought it into disrepute. Do you consider yourself a mercenary? No, I don't. I'm not a mercenary. Uh, I'm a contract soldier. And what do you think the difference is? I think that someone who does the work purely for money and is prepared to risk his life purely in financial terms, is not going to give the client, his employer, the best possible service. Uh, my service is more ideological. I believe in what I'm doing. And from that point of view, the financial side is not so important. That, I think, is the basic difference. So idealism counts a lot to you? I think it does, yes. What do you feel about working for a Marxist government? Um, I'm not a politician. I'm a professional soldier. Uh, and I get on and do my job and I, I train soldiers and I believe that training soldiers in this country is a very worthwhile job and I believe that I am backing the right side. I know that this government is trying to make things better. Um, I think uh, this Marxist-Leninism is slowly fading away but that doesn't interest me. If I feel that I'm uh, achieving something for the betterment of the people then I'll go for it. What I look at when I'm here is the suffering of these people in Mozambique. If you see some of these refugee camps, it's unbelievable the way they live. The people in general are suffering badly because of actions by bandits that are running around in this part of the world.
convoy has returned with its consignment of tea. It was a hard journey, but this time there were no attacks. Yeah, it looks like a pretty good load, actually. Yeah. We must have got about, I reckon, probably about 46 tons. Easy. Yeah. Better than normal. Yeah. We're achieving more than I thought we would achieve, to be quite frank, given the materials and the support that we have. Um, we are moving tea. I think we've done a very good job. This country needs economic development, and the only way it's going to get it is from large multinationals coming in. They will not operate in this country unless they are given security and are protected. If they are allowed to operate, um, they will ultimately generate um, a buoyant economy and a better way of life for the average Mozambique. For these men, training is nearly complete. They look good and march well. These proud soldiers now boast smart new uniforms, brand new weapons, and training direct from British officers. I've had a most marvellous career. I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it, and uh, were I to have my life over again, I would have done exactly the same thing. It's been extremely interesting, extremely challenging, and um, I couldn't have wished for a better life. Another convoy has run into trouble. We got some bad news on the radio this morning, um, informing us that at uh, 10.27 hours, the T convoy ran into a banded ambush about 20 kilometres out of Greeley. Uh, we understand that the armoured personnel carrier has been damaged by mortar fire. There are probably casualties and we've lost radio communications with the convoy. I've arranged for relief force to go out from both Gruy and from Ruasi uh, in an effort to support the convoy and uh, bail it out. Late at night, the trucks return. They bear the scars of their encounter and tea and more refugees from the countryside. Um, what were the um, casualties incurred on this convoy? Uh, 
Uh, we had four wounded and uh, a soldier from another battalion was killed in the ambush. Where are the wounded now? The wounded have been sent down to the hospital. Right, okay. And seriously wounded? Two of them were seriously wounded. I believe that there is tremendous potential here in this country for contract soldiering. The country desperately needs security. There is nowhere in Mozambique where good, well-trained soldiers could not make a tremendous impression on the security of the population and security for development of economic projects. And I think that we've got work here for many years to come. Do you think the British government approves of what you're doing? Yes, yes I do. Um, they uh, obviously uh, find it difficult to, uh, to get too close to what we're doing because after all we are a, a commercial company. Um, but uh, they support what we're doing here. I think they believe in, in, in our aims because that happens to be the same aims that they have and they're very much tied up with their foreign policy. Um, and so we do get support. Britain gives Mozambique 30 million pounds a year. Getting the tea out is a help, but is not the solution to the country's problems. While the war goes on, all economic improvement can only be marginal. Recently, their prime minister noted that Mozambique produced only 10% of its grain needs. How do we survive, he asked? We survive on foreign aid. Africa.